the Gateway of Hope Church, where we believe in connecting real people to a real God in a real way. Now, enter into worship with us, grab your Bible and prepare your heart, for you are about to be taught the Word of God. Jeremiah, what do you see? And I 
I said, I see a branch from an almond tree. The Lord said, that's right. And it means that I am watching and I will certainly carry out all my plans. Get up and prepare for action. Yes. Yes. Go out and tell them everything yes. I tell you to say. Don't be afraid of them. For today I have made you strong, like a fortified city that cannot be captured, like an iron pillar or a bronze wall. You will stand against the whole land, the kings, officials, priests, and the people of Judah. They will fight you, but they will fail. Oh, yes. For I am with you, and I will take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Gateway, we've had two words of prophecy spoken over us. We're to reach the multitudes, and this is to be a house of healing. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And every time I read this this week, what I saw was to go out. Yes. We have been in two years of getting up and preparing. As a corporation, as a corporate body, we've been in preparation. And I really feel so strong in my spirit that our time of corporate preparation is drawing nigh. And our time to go yes. is drawing near. Yes, yes. We're going to go without being afraid. We're going to go. He's going before us. He's already gone before us and prepared the way. And he, he will fight for us. He will be with us. And he will protect yes. us. It's good. Rise up. Whatever your calling is, everyone in here has, has a calling. Something. Whether it's in your job, whether it's something here at the church, there's something everyone, God has called you to do. Rise up. Rise up. Prepare yourself. As we've prepared as a corporate body, prepare yourself for what the Lord has for you. He has spoken. He's spoken clearly to us over the last two years. Yes, He has. And now is the time for us to transition, I believe, to transition from the preparation time to the going time. In the name of the Lord. Father, we thank You for this time this morning as we rise up and prepare to go out before, thank you. before you to take Your Word and Your goodness and Your salvation to the lost in this city. As we prepare to meet the multitudes, as we prepare to make this a house of healing, and as we prepare to take this city for you. Lord, those are the three things that have been on my heart this week. Multitudes, house of healing, and taking this city. As we prepare to do that, as we rise up this morning before you, meet us here. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, everybody. I said good morning, everybody. I know they stole an hour from you last time. I know they did. I know you ain't happy about it. But I tell you, I'm going to go back to the enemy's camp, and I'm going to take back what he stole from me. My rest is in the Lord. That's work. He said, if you wait on me, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and they will not faint. So if you're a little tired today, then I got the right recipe for you. Let's worship the Lord with gladness. Let's worship. Let's celebrate. Let's not wait for a feeling because if you wait for a feeling, you want to wait a long time. Let's love him today. Come on, right now. Would you lift your hand right now? This very moment, lift your hand and then hold the outfit of this service. Go ahead and tell Lord, I come here to worship you. And I will pass down every high thing now in the name of Jesus. I take it captive. I take captive my tiredness. I take captive my weariness. I take captive my ill body. But now in the name of Jesus, I proclaim that I will worship you, O God.
says that when the apostles came together, I believe that was in Acts 4. In the book of Acts, they came together after they had been persecuted by the Sanhedrin and they went together and they began to pray. And they began to cry out to the Lord. And as they, in their, in their moment of desperation, began to cry out to yes. Him, yes. the Bible says that the place where they gathered together was shaken. I don't know about you, but there is a time, especially during this season, where we're getting ready to come into our, our second year anniversary and other things going on and all these things. I don't know about you, but I still have that desperation for you. I need you more than I need the air that I breathe. Amen? How many of you, how many are out there like that today? I need him. I need him more than the air I breathe. More than the song that I sing. My life belongs to him.
You alone have the words of eternal life. That same group of apostles that Kendrick said a moment ago, when they went up into that room and they prayed after they had been threatened not to proclaim that name, returned back to that same Sanhedrin and said, we cannot help but to proclaim his name. For salvation is found in no other name under heaven or hell, oh, where I we must be saved. And so I love singing, I'm desperate for you. And I love singing, I'm lost without you. But I tell you, I got a greater song than that. And it is, I'm saved because of you. I'm found because of you. We were a people who had no hope. And now we have the hope of the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And in that name, the word says that we can boldly approach the throne of grace in our hour of need. And we can make our petitions known. And so right now, we're going to go to the Lord and we're going to pray. I know that Michelle is back in the back and faithful to the house of God as always. A little out of the weather today. We're going to believe God to touch her in her body. And there's, there's so many others and we don't have the time to get into all of them. I do have one that the West called me yesterday and his mom was kind of taking a little turn for the worse and they're not sure the family is roping with decisions and they don't know what to do whether assisted living or skilled nursing or but I know the name of Jesus and I know who provides both healing in that name and also the one who provides wisdom when we don't know what else to do so come on right now you take your thing to the Lord and you take theirs as well. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, today we come not by might nor by power, but in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God, that you are touched by the feeling of our infirmity, God. That, that when we pray, it's not a burden to you. That what we might seem to think is inconsequential or small, Lord, to you it's not. So, Lord Jesus, right now, would you go and would you minister to those who are in need of a healing touch today in their body? Lord, would you touch Michelle, Lord, as she is serving in your house today? Lord, you proclaimed in your word, healing is the children's bread. And, Lord, as her child, Lord, I ask you, Lord, to touch her, Lord, according to your word. So let it be to her now, in Jesus' name. Lord, would you touch Brother West's mom right now, where she is? Touch those legs. God, we pray for wisdom, rest for the family who's been caring for mom, and for wisdom and the ability to make right and discerning choices. And Lord, for every need that is standing in this room today, Lord, that is represented by an uplifted hand or an unspoken need, Father, would you minister to them where they are today? Minister, Lord Jesus, in their finances, in their bodies, in their emotions, in their homes, in their jobs. Lord, we look to you, for you alone have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? Father, now we just conclude our time of worship before we go to the Word by simply saying, Thank you, Lord. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I thank you, Lord, that we can all proclaim what the angels cannot. I'm saved because of you. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Do you love them today? Yes. I love them. I love them. You may be seated this morning in his presence. Thank you. All right. Isaiah chapter 43 is what we're going to talk today about. And I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about through the water and the fire. All right. So say that with me. Through the water, water. And, the water. and the fire. And the fire. Or in the words of Sweets Brown, the fire. The fire. <laughs> Lord Jesus. And the first thing that we think about when we think about Sweets Brown is her favorite line. What was her favorite line? Ain't, Ain't nobody, nobody got, got time, time for that. that. And that's the way that we view fiery trials and watery tests in our lives. I ain't got time for this, Jesus. I'm a little busy right now trying to get through my life, and I don't know what you're doing with all these obstacles, 
that are just kind of cropping up in my life. But Jesus, quite frankly, now listen up, Lord, because I, I think I might know better than you on this. Oh. I ain't got time for that. Right? Oh. That's the way that we approach it sometimes. Yes. We've come this far by starting back in January by talking about the covenant promises of God. And that even in the very outset of the book of Genesis, we began to see the grace oh. of God. The covenant of yeah. grace that was displayed time and time and time again. And as we've been reading all of these, these several months now, you will have come across the word covenant often in your reading. As a matter of fact, this past week, a major theme of the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah is the covenant of God. Then the second week, we talked about types and shadows and how in the Old Testament, and in the law itself, the law that most of us, you know, thumb our noses down at and say, ooh, I don't want none of that, there are types and shadows, and there is the character of God revealed in the Old Testament, that we see God as a holy God. He's not like all those other statues that people go out there and worship. And even again, this week, in the readings of Jeremiah, how many times did Jeremiah go to them and say, Oh, you foolish, foolish people, you going out there bowing down to these things, that, these idols that have hands but cannot touch you, ears but cannot hear you, mouths but cannot speak, and eyes and cannot see. We saw that God is not like other gods, and he said, And you are also holy, you are also set apart, you are not to be ordinary like all of the others. We see the character of God. Then Pastor Sean came and preached the week that I was up in Dallas, up at New Covenant of Dallas, and Pastor Sean came in here, and I heard he tore it up, and he told you all to cut it out. Uh -huh. yep. Cut it out. And we learned that God is not looking for a people who are merely circumcised in the flesh, but of the heart, that they have taken away certain areas of their heart and have said, that I surrender all of it, yeah. even if it's going to be a little painful to yeah. surrender it. Yeah. Then I, when I got back here, I let y'all have it with telling you, it's time for us to kill some sacred cows. Right. It's yeah. time for us to give up if we're going to move forward, not in the salvation of God, because salvation is purely a work of grace and grace alone. Yeah. But if we are going to fulfill the call that God has placed on us, and if we're going to walk under the mantle of the anointing that He has given to us, yeah. there is a necessity for us to go ahead and butcher some of the sacred cows that we've been holding on to. I will mm. preach that whole one again. And then Brother Chris mm. come up here and tore it apart and preach the best sermon I think I have ever heard him to preach and talked about rebuilding the wall. If you weren't here for that, I'm going to tell you right now. Go on that YouTube, Google it up. It is good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the next one because I hear it's going to be even gooder. <laughs> going to be gooder then the week after that Sister Debbie come up in here All right. she talked about what's in your storehouse yeah. and has your Levite left mm. I ain't going to preach her sermon for her either but go watch it last week we talked about the wisdom of the ages we said that wisdom is found in his word and in his spirit and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom so today, we come to through the water and through the fire. And as, I've no, as we're going through these things, I'm noticing a progression. The life of Israel is a character and is a type and a shadow of the life of the believer and of how we act just like them. Yes. As we get into the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah was written towards the end of the reign of Josiah and then carries on through the reigns of Hezekiah, and Jeremiah picks up after Hezekiah is gone, and he's with Jehoiakim and Je whatever his name is, the last one. We'll just leave it at that. Zedekiah and, and we'll just call him Jay, because I can't ever pronounce his name, all right? This is kind of, uh, I'm not going to sit here and say how you say his name, but, <laughs> but as we get into that, as we, as we get to that point, we realize that God was a little on the, I don't know, perturbed side with Israel. How many of you have ever gotten perturbed with your children? 
<laughs> or if you ain't got cheerings with somebody close to you. They did something and you forgave them. And then they did it again. And you forgave them. And they did it again. And you forgave them. And then they did it again. It happened to you a lot. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. They did it over and over, and after a while, you're like, okay, they hadn't learned their lesson. Yes. Right. I'm going to forgive them, but yep. it's time for them to have some consequences for their behavior because I ain't got time for that. Mm. Nobody oh, got yes. time for that. And at this point, when you read the story, as we go through it, in Joshua, they entered the promised land. And before that generation that saw the Jordan River parted and then cross over on dry ground, the same generation that saw the conquest of Canaan land for them, that same generation set up asterisk poles and Baal altars and they did exactly what God said you shall not do. What were the first two of the commandments? You shall have no other gods before me and you shall not make unto yourselves any graven images. Why? Because God don't like you fooling around on Him. Oh, oh you better That's say why. that. Just like you don't want your spouse fooling around Ooh. on you. You see, God viewed Israel much as He views the church today as His bride. Yes. You and His bride was going out and messing around with other gods. My, my, and God my. wasn't quite too happy about it. Oh, no. And by the time we get to Isaiah, by the time we get there, the northern kingdom of Samaria, Israel, remember Israel had split into the northern kingdom of Samaria, the southern kingdom of Judah, Samaria had already fallen into captivity. God had said it's enough, because remember the terms of the covenant. If you will worship me and obey and serve me only. It wasn't so much about obedience as it was about right worship. If you will make sure that I am your God, then you will be my people. Amen. But if you go whoring after other gods well, like the nations say before it you, like it. Right. say it like it is. I will kick you out of this land just like I kicked the folks out before you. Mm. At least he's consistent. <laughs> well, God had enough with Samaria because in all of their lineage of all the kings, there was not one of their kings who ever did good. As a matter of fact, each one of them. He did worse than his father before him. He did worse than his father before him. And then that one did worse, and then that one did worse. And God had said, enough. And a, a guy named Sennacherib had come and laid besieged to Samaria and carried them off into captivity. And back then, it wasn't like today, if you lose a war, that the conquering army is going to go ahead and send you billions of dollars and rebuild your country for you. Oh, okay. say that. It wasn't like that. When you lost the war, they kicked you out of the land. Yeah. They, they took, took it. everybody. Yeah, every, mm -hmm. And everything. From the youngest to the oldest, right. from the richest to the poorest, and they made them walk. And they left Israel and took them off to Assyria. And here is now Hezekiah sitting on the throne of Judah, and he sees his brothers, the ten northern tribes, carried off into captivity. And here comes Sennacherib. The army of Syria had surrounded Judah. What does Judah mean, by the way, y'all? Praise. Praise. Don't you feel like sometimes your praise is surrounded and mm. you can't figure out what to do? Yeah. Because the praise had left. See, Judah was only Judah in name only. It was only praise and praise only. Praise is not... What we do, it's who we are. Yes. We are to be a praise unto the Lord. Yes. So praise is not who they is not what they did. It's not by going into the temple because they still went to the temple every single day. They still offered every That's kind of good. sacrifice. Right. Come on. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go somewhere with this, so I need you mm -hmm. to stick with me. Yes. Praise was in their mouth, but not in their heart. Oh, wow. They had failed to abide by the term of the covenant of cut it out. And God said, these people praise me with their lips, and yet their heart is far from me. Sennacherib was laying the siege to Jerusalem, and he was blaspheming God. As you read the 15th through the 18th chapter of Isaiah, there you read the account of how Sennacherib was sitting there and saying, your God will rescue you. Your God's no stronger than the gods of all the other nations. And all of the Judites... 
of feigned shock. Oh! <laughs> How could he say that? How could... Oh, God, you have to act, because did you hear what he said? And God turned back around and said, Oh, I heard what he said. Mm -hmm. But I also see what you say in your life every single day. Oh, right. You see, Sennacherib was just bold enough to say it with his mouth. Right. They mm -hmm. served him with their mouth, and yet they blasphemed him every single day in their actions. They profaned the name of God. And God says to Hezekiah, All right, I will let you out of it this time. Yeah. But consequences are coming. Oh, oh, you have crossed a line, and at this oh, point, geez. because I love you, geez. I must discipline you. Right. My word is true. Oh, and he said, if I said it, will I not perform it? Huh. And we're very quick yeah. to take all the blessings of God when he speaks them. Right. But when he says that oh, there's also some judgment coming, we, we want him to quickly change his mind. Oh, you see, for this reason, judgment was coming. For every action, there is, there is a reaction. Come on. And judgment, the Apostle Paul said, begins in the house, house of, of God. God. And what did we read last week? Discipline simply shows. He loves us. As you read Isaiah and Jeremiah both, you hear the pain in God's heart as he realizes he's going to have to punish them. I never used to believe that when... You know, that when parents would look at their kids just before they was going to get a whooping. Oh, this is going to hurt me more. It's going to hurt you. Yeah, uh-huh. But I believe as you read Isaiah, you hear the pain of the Father's heart and how he begins to speak of his, of his beloved Israel. Sometimes we feel like our praise is surrounded. And we are besieged on every side. Sometimes it's things of our own doing, much like it was for Judah. And sometimes it's not. And God has some things to say about that. Are you ready to hear what it is? Stand with me as we go to the Word. That was all my intro, Kyle. It does not count to my time. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 43, starting with verse number 1. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid. Say that, do not, not, be, afraid. Do not be afraid. For I have ransomed you, I have called you by name, and you are mine. When, say when. When. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When, say when. When. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When, say when. When. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. And the flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. Now skip down with me to verse 22. But dear family of Jacob, you refuse to ask for my help. You have grown tired of me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep or goats for burnt offerings. You have not honored me with sacrifices, though I have not burdened or wearied you with requests for grain offerings and frankincense. You have not brought me fragrant calmness or pleased me with fat from sacrifices. Instead, you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your, with your faults. I, yes, I alone. Listen to that after he makes the accusation. After he pronounces them guilty, look what he says. Ah, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake. Not for yours, for his. Come on. Let us review the situation together so you can present your case to prove your innocence. From the very beginning, your first ancestors sinned against me. All your leaders broke my law. That is why I have disgraced your priests. I have decreed destruction for Jacob and shame for Israel. But now listen to me, Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. The Lord who made you and helps you says, Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, O dear Israel, my chosen one, for I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields, and I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. Yes, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask you now that, Lord, over these next few minutes, as we talk about this, let it be ingrained in our heart what you say. Let us pay heed to your word, 
for it is able to save our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be seated. I'm going to try to preach now. A little wound up already. Lord Almighty, y'all on the front row might need some windshield wipers. I don't know. The first thing he says, and I love it, he says, fear not. Fear not. Now, the first thing I see in that, Janice, that doesn't sound to me like it's optional. All right. He didn't say, well, I recommend that you don't be afresh. Jeez. I have a suggestion for you. He says as a command. It is an emphatic, it means fear not. Would you like to know what, that, what, what the Hebrew means in English? Mm -hmm. Would you like to know? Because yeah. it's really deep. Lean in close because I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Fear not. The Hebrew in English means fear not. All right. All right. <laughs> I mean, it is as clear as clear can be. Don't be afraid. You see, our very first reaction, the very first reaction in the face of adversity is what? Fear. Ah! Right, it is, we turn into little drama queens at the first sight of the smallest opposition and, and, and adversarial uh, oppression. We look at that and go like, oh, not for me, God. No, I don't want that. You start looking on the horizon and you see things are, there might be a little storm brewing. And you're like, oh my Lord, oh help me. You call me up on the phone. Oh, brother Steve, what am I going to do? And then you look at me. I can, I mean, I'm imagining you're looking at me because I can't see through the phone. But I'm imagining when I say to you what the word says, that you move the glasses down on the edge of your nose and you go like, did he just say that? Uh -huh. When I tell you, fear not. Amen. Don't be afraid. And there is a very easy reason why God says, fear not. Would you like to know what it is? Uh -huh. That's good, because otherwise this would be a very short sermon. <laughs> you see, first of all, you should not fear, because when you are in the midst of fear, you make bad choices. Right. Yeah. And many times, the opposition that we face in our life is already a consequence of bad choices, isn't it? Right. Yeah. There are already some bad choices that we made, and so now we are standing right here on the face of this opposition, and now we look at it, and because we're afraid of the consequence, we make another bad yeah. decision on top of it. Yeah. Now, if you don't believe that is true, just go down to any elementary school and watch what happens when little Johnny does something wrong and the teacher saw it. And the teacher goes to little Johnny and says, why did you do that? And what does Johnny say? Well, I didn't do that. <laughs> right? And I know none of you ever li lied to cover up something that you did. Uh -huh. I mean, because I was a little saint too. I would never... <laughs> have done that. Oh, God help me. I've, uh, maybe I shouldn't say that up here on the pulpit. You see, we are prone when we are in the midst of a problem that we try to, we try to fix our problem, and in the process of doing that, we make it worse. Yeah. All because we're afraid of the consequences that are coming. Bad choices on top of bad choices lead to calamity. Mm -hmm. But there's another thing that fear does. Fear magnifies. Fear makes yes. it to be big, yes. right? Fear it ends up becoming a magnifying oh, glass yes. to us. And so we look at our problem and the opposition or the situation, and because we are cowering in fear, and we, we view ourselves like a little tiny grasshopper in comparison to it, suddenly whoosh, the problem is huge. <coughs> Now let me give you, can I, can I give you the antidote to that? Yes. Because you see, not all fear is anti-biblical. Right. Mm -hmm. Not all fear is unbiblical. We read last week, the fear of the Lord mm -hmm. is the beginning of all wisdom. Now that is not a fear in terror. That is a fear that is a respect, a reverence for the Father. Let me tell you why it's the beginning of wisdom. When I fear, what I fear gets magnified. Yes. Jeez. And so when I choose to fear the Lord, instead of fearing my problem, suddenly my God becomes bigger than my problem. I put things in the right perspective. It's like turning the magnifying glass around and seeing through it the correct way. Now listen to me. God's command is fear not. Why? Because of the covenant, y'all. You see, 
even though they violated the terms. He had bound himself when he made it, and he said, this is an everlasting covenant. That means they couldn't break it. That means they could not cancel the effect of the covenant. As a matter of fact, towards the end of the book of Isaiah, God says, if you think I can cancel my covenant with the people of Israel, then you're going to have to get me to defy the laws of gravity. You're going to have to tell them, we're going to have to get the sun and the moon to change the order in which they set and arise. We're going to, because I'll do that before I break my covenant. And my friend, God made a covenant with yes. you. Yes. Even when you are disobedient, right. even when you run, even when you violate your terms, and even when because you violated the terms of the covenant, he's going to have to send some discipline. His covenant with you is everlasting, and the promise he has for you is, yes, my discipline yes. will come, but I will not destroy you. Oh, I have you promised you I would not. I am only doing this to make you stronger oh, and better and to build in you something. Yes. You see, because of covenant, because of covenant... While unpleasant, He does not destroy us. Adversity is used by God. Don't fear the problem, I'm telling you. Fear God. Put it in the right perspective. To fear the Lord. God says, fear not. It's a command. And in it, in this command of fear not, He points past your present circumstance to the future promise of what He will do if you will walk on the right path. Now let me move on here. Then he says, there's a reason that you should not fear. You see, there were a whole lot of people in Jeremiah's day when God was saying, I'm sending judgment, I'm sending judgment, I'm sending judgment. And these prophets, the false prophets, were going like, oh, don't you worry about All nothing. Right. Ain't nothing going to happen. Yeah. Oh, he's, Jeremiah's been saying that for ten years. And there ain't been no judgment coming down yet, so there won't be no judgment now. So you can trust me. Don't be afraid. And God says, mm-hmm. <laughs> You see, we got to make sure we, we keep things in the right perspective. Judgment was coming. Judgment was coming, and judgment comes when, whenever it needs to. But, but he says there's a reason that you don't need to be afraid if you, are, if you line yourself back up under the covenant terms. Because I have redeemed you. Say redeemed. redeemed. Now see, we as Americans and Western people don't understand the idea of a redeemer. Right? A redeemer. Several weeks back now, we read the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, we read about a man named Boaz, who would be a kinsman redeemer. Now you're like, well, what does that mean, right? What is a redeemer? A redeemer in Jewish culture was a family member who would buy someone out of slavery right. who found themselves in it. Yes. It was like Boaz with Naomi. Naomi was so far in debt Jeez. and could not get out of it. And so Boaz paid a debt Jeez. that he did not owe. Jeez. Because Naomi could not pay a debt that right. she did owe. Jeez. We see the story repeated again in the book of Hosea. As Hosea goes and he attempts to go find his harlot wife All right. mm. who had been sold into slavery. And what does Hosea do but to buy her out of it? And he says, I've bought you and I've given you my name. My friend, we were slaves to sin, Paul says. Yes. And in the words of the old gospel song, He paid a debt, He did not owe, I owed a debt, I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. You see, I owed a debt I couldn't pay. Come on. You owed a debt you couldn't pay. Yes. We couldn't even begin to make a down payment on the debt. Our best efforts, our best effort wouldn't add up to but a fraction of a fraction of a 1% of what we owed. And Jesus said, don't you worry about that. 
I will take care of the penalty for your debt for you. I will redeem you. And he looks at Israel and he says, now listen, yeah, I'm going to have to discipline you because you've, yeah, you've kind of done your own thing. And I'm going to chastise you to bring you back in the terms of my covenant. But don't be afraid. Look to me. Make sure you keep your eyes on me in the middle of it. Because I've redeemed you. I've paid for you. And nobody can take you. The, Jesus said, I know those who are mine. They are firmly in my hand. And the sheep the Father puts in my hand. Nobody. Say nobody. Nobody. No. And last time I checked, that Greek word for nobody meant nobody. Not the General Council of the Assemblies right. of God. Yes. Not the United Pentecostal Church. Not your sin. And Ooh. certainly not the devil. Jeez. Nobody. When we are washed in the blood right. of the Lamb, right. nobody can snatch us out of the right. arms right. of Almighty God. Thank God for that. Oh, yes. And when I say, when I see that, Ooh. I no longer have to live in the fear that I learned growing up in the Assemblies of God. I've always wondered, oh, if I pay off my tithe off the net and not off the gross and Jesus comes back, I'm not going to go to heaven. And if I go dancing, I'll go straight down. And as we heard a couple of weeks ago from Pastor Chris, apparently you can go shaking because it's all about what you do with it. Oh! Yeah. I took notes, see? Yeah. <laughs> but man, we were taught, man, if you go to one of them dens of iniquity, mm. called a movie house, uh -oh. you will go straight to hell. Tell it. Mm. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Forget the hand basket. You're just going straight there. <laughs> you see, we were taught a gospel of fear, oh, yeah. right, of works. Yeah. Whenever we sit there and we keep hearing this over and over again about how if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. That's not grace. That's Ooh. not love. That is fear. And God says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. You didn't redeem yourself. And all of your good works didn't redeem you. Because if your good works could redeem you, your bad works could unredeem you. Now let me move on here. Hallelujah. He paid the debt. You see, you've been bought with a price. I, all of you know I just got a, got a car back in January. I can take good care of my car. Change the oil. Rotate the tires. I know I'm impressing some of you with my mechanical <laughs> prowess and knowledge right now. Wow. I, I, I know how to check the fluids. And I, I know where you put the thingamajiggy to put the gas in the tank. Oh. And okay. I, I know how to check the tire. I can wash it. Or in the words of Pasadena, Pasadena's, I wash it. All right? I want to make Bill feel comfortable here, all right? Because we don't judge. We welcome, all, we welcome everybody. <laughs> Well, I wash it. I keep it clean. Why? Because I take care of the stuff I bought. You come to my house, the house is neat. It's clean. It's in order. Because I take care of my stuff. My friend, God bought you. He takes care of his stuff. And he's going to see to it. Ain't nothing going to happen to it. That's why he says, fear not. He says, I called you by name. I bought you. And I called you by name. Now this is good. And see, we get excited about this, Brother Sean. When we think about, oh, he, he called me by name. But you've got to remember this. This was written to who? This was written to the people of Israel. Amen. He had changed their name, y'all. You see, his name was Jacob. And what does Jacob mean? Deceiver. Liar. Hypocrite. And he changed his name from that. Now, how, how'd you like to be his... I can't... I, have you ever paused? And when you read that, okay, his, his name was Liar, essentially. His mama, upon giving birth to this kid, kid pops out, and they say, Well, congratulations! You got a little baby boy! What you want to name him? Liar. <laughs> the kid hasn't even spoken a word yet. Hasn't said anything. The first thing his mama calls him is liar. But that was his name. He was a deceiver. And God looked when Jacob got a hold of God and wrestled with God at Bethel. 
God touched him and said, Today I change your name, and you will no longer be known as a liar. But I change your name to Israel, which means Prince of God. You see, when we got a hold of God, when we went to our Bethel, and we said, God, I will not let go until you bless me. He took us and He changed our name from sinner to saint. I am no longer a sinner saved by grace. Bless you, Jesus. No, sir. I am a saint of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I thank God for it and I rejoice. Forgive me, somebody. Hold my mule. I shall not today. Hey. If that don't move you, I recommend that you get your name changed. You see... God did that before Jacob had done anything. You see, God put into practice what He asked you to do. God, when Jacob spoke those things which were not as though they were, He looked at Jacob and He said, I know that everybody else says that you are a liar and you are a deceiver, but I look down on you and I see the potential that you have in the kingdom and I say, you are a prince of God. You are chosen by me. And that's why I don't need to be afraid. Because God sees me not as everybody else sees me. God sees who I am destined to be. God sees me through the calling that He has placed upon my life. And then we get to His promise. Mm -hmm. We all like promises, don't we? Yeah. Everybody, nod, everybody nod your head. Go ahead, nod your head. You like promises? Kai, you like promises? Uh-huh. See, now I just have to force Kyle to play along. Here's His promise. It's a good one. Rose, are you ready for the promise? You will go through the fire. Aren't you excited? <laughs> Michelle, I got a promise for you. You will go through the river of difficulty. Yay! Fire! In the words of Bishop anymore, fire! You will go. Pastor Chris, I got a good promise for you. Good promise. You get to go through deep waters. Yes! Isn't that great? Don't you sit there. I mean, doesn't that just make us shout for the first? What do we do when we hear deep waters coming? Run! Pack it up! Let's go! I ain't hunkering down for that. Sorry, Judge Ed Emmett, but deep water coming, I'm not hunkering. I'm going. I'm out of here. It's time to go. Rivers of difficulty? Uh, you got to be kidding me. Well, don't you know, God, who I am? Uh-huh. You see, when rivers of difficulty come our way, and adversity comes into our life, what's our first question to God? Why me? And what does the big reply come back from heaven? Why not? <laughs> what makes you so special that, I, that you shouldn't go through those things? You see, it doesn't say if you go through the rivers of difficulty. It says when. Honey, you may as well mark it down. It's coming. If it ain't come yet, give it a few minutes. It's like Texas weather. It changes real fast. Amen. You see, our, our desire is to run from these things. Yet He leads us to them. Oh, I know this is not the kind of shouting sermon you wanted to hear this morning. I know you wanted to get, have me get up here and preach to you the same Pentecostal fluff that you've heard so many years. Oh, if you'll just serve Jesus, everything will just be sunshine and roses all the time. Glory to Jesus, let the hallelujahs hold. Isn't that what we want? You see, trials and adversities, though, he says are inevitable. They will come. Why? Sometimes because of choices that we have made. Often because of choices that we have made. Probably more often than not because of choices. Here we are planting bad seed and then we pray for crop failure. Oh, please God, don't let this grow. Please. Please God. You out there with a shovel trying to dig it up after it's put some roots down. It's like planting banana trees. Once you got it down, they're going to come up. Right? Sometimes they're used by God as discipline, as we read here. Because he who the Lord loves, he disciplines. 
And my goodness, if he ever didn't discipline me, I started wondering if he did love me. Moving on, he says, sometimes James says, it's used to build character and thereby to build faith. And James says, count it all joy. Yay! How many of you want to party with me? We're going to have rivers of difficulty. Isn't that great? Mama, are you excited about that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It builds up our faith. And then Jesus said the other, the other reason why. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. Sometimes there ain't no reason. Now I know that's the ones that drive us nuts the most. Because we want that answer on that important question of why. Why, why, why. Well honey, you ain't God. You don't need to know why. But God does give you some instruction. The trial we walk through today, guys, prepares you for the blessings that come next and for the calling that is to come. God uses those things to move you. You see, to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah yesterday, I was reading it, he says as he's talking about these captives who have been led away, they're now in Babylonian exile. He says, I know you're going through adversity. I know you don't like it. And I know that you're wondering if I know what I'm doing. But I know the plans yes. I have for you, says yes. the Lord. Yes. Plans for good and not for evil. You look at this and say, oh, this is bad. But God says, no, no, no. You misunderstand. You're looking too close. You're magnifying your problem. Fear me instead. Look at me and realize I'm bigger than your adversity is today. But there's another promise that's in this. It's not only the promise that you will pass through the waters of difficulty. Not only the promise that you will walk through the fire and go through the deep waters. But there is the promise in every single one of them. He will be with you. Yes, and he will. Oh, I don't know. We believe that sometimes. Now see, he's telling this. Do you notice this? He's telling them this before the problem hits. And you know why he's telling them before? Because when you're in the middle of the deep water, and when you're in the middle of the fire, and when you're going through the rivers of difficulty, you don't feel him. That's right. And you are likely to panic, and he knows you. You see, when you get up on one of them aeroplanes, they don't wait until all heck is breaking loose in the cockpit to get up there and say, we'd like to brief you about the safety features of this aircraft. They tell you that while you are securely on the ground, before you left the gate, before there's any danger, before there's any problem, and before there's 30,000 feet underneath you to fall down through. They tell you that then because they know that when the problem comes, you ain't going to be listening to the flight attendant. He can be up there going, y'all, ah! You ain't paying no mind to him because you worried about him. Now, hopefully, you listened to them when they went up there and did the whole da 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 I know. I can edit that out. That's a good one. You see, the reason they tell you that beforehand is because they don't want to wait until it happens. And God's telling you now, when you're not in the middle of the fire, when you're not in the middle of the river of difficulty, when you're not going through the deep water, don't be afraid. I am going to be with you. Now listen up and let me tell you what you need to do at that point. You see, the whole point of that safety briefing on the airplane is to tell you what to do. You see, you cannot just sit in your seat when the plane hits the ground and say, okay, come rescue me. They're going to get here any minute while the plane's burning down around you or water's filling the cabin. You see, the promise comes before. And what does he say? When you pass through the waters, when you pass, you, you, you see, I got, I about shot at my head off yesterday afternoon. I was writing this down because. So often, we get the idea that we look to God to be our Superman. Yeah. Yep. 
Rescue me, God! And God says, you walk. Thank you, Jesus. You walk. You put one foot in front of the other. You hold on. You go through. You pass through. You see, guys, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith to sit there and stand still and say, all right, right. I reckon I'll just sit here and get, right. you know, until right. somebody gets me. Right. But boy, it does take a lot of faith yeah. when you're in the middle of the worst trials of your life to say, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, I'm going to keep on going on. And the reason, Pastor Ken, I can keep on going on is because he's with me. Yes. Yes. That's right. Uh, now, I realize in the middle of the fire, Brother Bob, I don't feel him right then. All right. He feels like he's a million miles away. But I heard in the safety briefing before the flight took off, right. he's going to be with me. I know he lit a path for me to walk in. How can I get out of here? I'm going to follow the lighted path yes. to the nearest exit. You see, God is faithful. There is no adversity that is overtaking you, 1 Corinthians says, but that which is common to a man. And with it, he will provide what? A way of escape. Y'all see that sign right back there? Y'all see that sign right back there? You know why it's there? That way, in case this place catches fire, you know how to get out of here. And God looks to you and He says, I've given you my word. I've given you my promise. Don't wait until everything's falling apart and then look for me because you won't be able, you won't know what to do. But if you listen right now, when you go through the fire, I will walk with you. I will carry you. I will make sure you get through it. One foot in front of the other. You see, then He says, and I love this, He stakes His entire reputation on it. That's a pretty big reputation. Yeah. This is the God of the universe. Amen. How many times does he tell Jeremiah, For I, the Lord of hosts, have spoken it. And he looks at Isaiah, and he tells Isaiah, Tell him this. And then when you finish, you tell him, and you make sure to tell him, I am the Lord your God. Amen. And that I am, when he says, I am, mm -hmm. that is the same thing that they told the children of Israel in captivity back in Egypt. Whom shall I say sent me? Tell them, I am that I am. Yes. You see, I am the Lord your God. Yes. Now, I am the Lord your God in the middle of the fire. Yes. I am the Lord your God in the middle of the water. I am the Lord your God in the middle of the river. I am the Lord your God. In other words, he said, this is not just some little vague promise that Isaiah had come up with in the middle of the night, something he thought, well, I want to preach the church happy on Sunday, and so I'll, I'll give him some superficial fluff and write it down. No, this is the Word of God. Put my name on it, God. Right. Yes. You see, last week, after we went down there to corporate drive, we voted to send a letter of intent, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I went back home and I typed up a letter. Typed that letter up, and what did I do at the very end? I signed them. All of this, all of these blessings are not because of them. That's good stuff. It's not because of them, Brother Sean, that he was doing this. It's not because they did anything that was that great or that they lived such reputable lives. Because remember, over and over again, Sister Kelly, throughout the whole chapter, the whole book, he's telling them, you're guilty. You are guilty. You deserve far more than the judgment I'm sending you. You're guilty. But then he says, Probably the most beautiful words in all of Isaiah. I, yes, I alone, will blot out your sins for my own sake. Why his sake? Because he had given them his name. They were no longer just Jacob the deceiver. They were princes of God. And my friend, the good news for you is, when you took the name of Jesus on as your own, when you accepted him 
and you have his name engraved on your heart. God said, I will blot out your sin, not just for your sake. Although you get a really good blessing for it. But my sake, I put my name on it. I stake my reputation on it. That I would see to it that you make it safely from life to eternity. He says, but now listen to me, Jacob, my servant. Israel, my chosen one. The Lord who made you and helps you says, don't be afraid. Notice he says it again. And God doesn't repeat himself because he's forgetful. When he repeats it, he means it's important. Listen, do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant. O dear Israel, my chosen one. Do you hear his love? I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched dry fields. And I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a river bank. That tells me, weeping indoors but for a night, joy comes in the morning. Adversity and trials and tests, Sister Janice, they're as sure as the sun rising tomorrow. But the good news that I have, oh, the good news that I have, is God doesn't just see my problem here today. He sees past it. He sees past the desert that I'm walking through. And he says, you're going to be like a lush meadow of green grass with plenty of water without need because I, the Lord, have spoken. Would you stand with me in this room this morning? Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. because of your choices, because God's disciplining you, because God's building character or faith in you, or because simply it rains on the just or the unjust. I don't know, and I can't answer that question, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter why you are there. What does matter is that you realize today that He's with you. Maybe today you're not in the water yet, but you've heard his voice. If this morning you're going through a fire and trial in your life, or if this morning you it feels like it's coming on and it's heading your way, the altar is open, and we're happy to pray with you this morning to encourage you in your faith and to build you up and to remind you he is with you. As we sing it again, the altar is open. Would you come? I'm falling on my knees, offering all of me. Jesus, Jesus, your all is heart is living for Oh, I'm falling, I'm falling. 
point, I would like for all of us, however, as a church body, to come together at the conclusion of our time. I'm going to ask you all just to join me here in the front as we make a group covenant with our Father today. I'm calling on God. our days 
And you've already promised that when we get into that water, when we get in the middle of that river, when we get in that fire, you won't be catching up with us, but you'll already be there waiting for us to shepherd us safely through. Lord, we put our trust in you. You're all of this heart is longing for. Go with us this week. Watch over us until the next time that we come together. Let us be people of your word and people of praise. In Jesus' name. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Our worship is not over. Our service is just beginning. Let's go be the people of God this week. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video of one of our worship services at Gateway of Hope Church, where real people are experiencing a real God in a real way. If that's happened to you while watching this video, we would love to hear from you. Please contact us via our website at gatewayhouston.org. We're located in Southwest Houston off the corner of Derry Ashford and West Highland, and we would love to meet you in person. Further information about service times and directions to our worship center can be found on our website, again, at gatewayhouston.org. Until we do see you, remember, our worship is not over. Our service is just beginning. Let's go and be the people of God. God bless you, and see you soon.